So thank you very much for being on the show, Mike, uh, talking about Gundam and Gunpla and all that fun stuff. Um, let's get started with um, kind of how you got into anime. Oh, geez. Uh, that's a hell of a story, actually. <laughs> um, shortly after I basically quit Boy Scouts at the ripe age of like eight or nine, because I wasn't big on not tying, mm. um, I somehow got subscribed to Boy's Life magazine and the Johnson mm. Smith catalog, oh. which I guess, you know, those Johnson are... Johnson Smith. <laughs> yeah, that's way back. And at the back of it, they advertised anime, cartoons from Japan, not mm. for kids. <laughs> and that... Perfect for a nine-year-old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what a nine-year-old needs to hear when they, you know, are curious to be more than a kid mm -hmm. and get in trouble. Yep. And they had advertised Akira, which wow. was then on the Sci-Fi Channel Saturday Anime oh, yes. block. And that was with some of the cable channels that we actually got back then. Mm. I watched it. I actually, it was not my first anime ever. I knew that it was anime. Ah, and yes. It was a thing. My first anime was Project Aiko. Wow. And, yeah. <laughs> that was one hell of an introduction. No kidding. So, and this is in, oh, geez, I want to say 1991, 92, maybe. Whoa. So it, it, I kind of was into it from then on. Mm. Not at the scale that people are into it today, mm -hmm. but. I would rent it whenever possible. I would, mm. uh, you know, acquire videos and that sort of thing. And that was VHS but, days, of course. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. I mean, the fan sub scene, I knew nothing about. I wasn't mm -hmm. part of the magazine culture. Yeah. But it was big, and I got really a lot more into it when I got into college. Mm. And which brings me into Gundam, because Gundam Wing, that was starting uh, on Toonami. Ah, yes. You, yeah. you, you too were a Gundam Wing. You, you started with Gundam Wing. Guilty as charged. Yep. That's how a lot of us got our start. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't get Toonami at home on cable. Mm. We did get it in college. And one of my the first friends I met, and you know, we bonded over watching Gundam Wing, and I mm -hmm. still remember fondly my buddy Kevin, who and we're still close today, this as fifteen years later, when Endless Waltz premiered on Toonami. Ooh. We had to cobble our money together because we couldn't watch it at the time it was on without missing dinner. So we did what two college freshmen with zero dollar incomes did best. We pooled our coins, ordered dominoes. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and watched Endless Waltz. It, yeah. it was awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I had a somewhat similar experience. Uh, a friend of mine at the time, uh, we watched Gundam Wing on the Midnight Run. Um, we started halfway through, though. <laughs> <laughs> so we had no idea what was going on, and then so we would kind of overload our brains watching Gundam Wing, and then relax watching the Frieza battle of Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> um, but then uh, we actually got a chance, we, we watched Endless Waltz at the uh, North American premiere at Otakon. Um, wow. And that, that was an experience, because it was, you know, 2,000 squealing Gundam Wing fans <laughs> in one audience. You know, every character came across, there was appla uh, applause, <laughs> screams, you know, Katra, I love you! Yeah, Which, intonations to kiss, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. So, um, uh, so you started with, with Gundam that way. Uh, how'd you get into Gunpla? You know, I always was envious of the people who could build Gunpla, mm. or, or models in particular. Mm -hmm. I, I made friends with uh, Sophie Thomas, who is a luminary to me mm. in the Gunpla community, at least on the East Coast. I looked up to her works with highest esteem mm. and huge amounts of respect and envy. And I always swore to myself, you know, one day, probably when I'm retired and having the full time, <laughs> you know, I'll take on Gunpla. I'll give it a shot. But I, you know, I was hanging around at Katsukon two years ago mm. with my friend Victor, and I was, we were just looking at the model contest. He mm -hmm. had a figure that was entered, and I remarked to him, man, this looks so cool. I wish one day I'll have the chance to do it, and nah, I got no free time. He basically told me, dude, you have two hours a night. You can totally do this. Yeah. And I figured, you know what? I've got a job. I can afford this stuff. I will give it a shot. Mm-hmm. My local hobby shop had the Build Strike full package. Um, you know, nice. Build, Fight Build Fighters was airing, and I was mm -hmm. watching it because I, you know, I like anime. I like Gundam. Yeah, let's watch it. It's a fun show. And they had it. I I spent too much time doing panel lines on it. I drew them in on the runners. <laughs> so needless to say, when I was only you know showing about half of it, I was like, "What the hell? This sucks." <laughs> but it went out. It actually came together so nicely. Mm. I realized this is something totally doable. Yeah, I got more and more into it. I built, bought more and more supplies. I bought a cheap airbrush and compressor combo and got into airbrushing right away. And it just became, to me, 
what it became was, you know, I'm in IT and I'm a systems mm. administrator and I'm used to doing a lot at once, mm. to having to focus on so many things at once. Gunpla forces you to unitask. You cannot do anything else if you are working on getting two parts together, yeah. if you are working on painting or doing some other step of the process. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. Yeah. And it's it's kind of zen-like in a way. I'm down in the basement. It's nice and cool. I have my focus on and it feels good to be building something, especially mm -hmm. when it's very intricate and detailed like Unplug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Wow. So you mentioned you, um, you know, you, you, your very first model kit. You're going in and you're you're adding the lines and all that kind of stuff. Um, when you approach a kit, um, what, how do you approach a kit? I mean, we, you know, what what is sort of your first steps? Um, first steps, I just kind of ask myself if I want to do anything special with it, or if I'm just going to do a straight or a painted build. Mm -hmm. uh, and these days, I haven't. I actually kind of took a break from Gunpla to try my hand at normal scale modeling. Oh, so nice. I'm just kind of getting back into it. And it just became a question of, I could do some of these things a little bit basically, but what else do I want to do to make this mine? Mm. And it just becomes a question of where I can add some personality. And I guess for me, my one thing is met metal details. I don't know why, oh. but to me, you know, these are mechanical creations. These are mm. you know, things that are made by humans. They are very flashy. They're very colorful in the anime and the various bits of media from which they come. Mm. But I see these things as implementations of tactical fighting mm. vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way that a tank will be painted in certain ways, you'll have bits of metal. In, in these cases, I just like to give it a little bit of metallic flash and pop to draw the eye and to invite people to see more, to get a little bit closer, you know, maybe they'll see some other details. Cool. And how do you do that? Well, the, met the metallics, my cheat code is, you know, having an airbrush enables you mm. to do a lot. But what I really try to think of is what looks like it's metal on the kit and what could be made to be a little bit more real. Thrusters mm -hmm. are my, you know, my area of expertise. Oh. Well, not so much expertise, but there's no reason that something that shoots out, you know, rockets or some other kinds of thrust would just be, you know, like gray plastic. These things are metal. <laughs> real, real rocket thrusters are the same. Yeah. I, a buddy of mine is an authority. I asked him, hey, listen, what would, what would a Saturn V, you know, thruster bell look like? What material mm. did they use? And the, my real secret, all clad. It's a hmm. paint. It's a paint company that manufactures lacquers for airbrushing. Okay. And the secret to the all clad is that you work with a gloss black enamel base. Hmm. You know, that's the first coat. You get that on, so it's mirror reflective. Really, the way that hmm. I test it is I hold it under a direct light bulb, slowly rotate the part. If you got a uniform reflection, you're good to go. Wow. Hmm. Yep. You spray on chrome, and it looks like the real thing. Hmm. The same for a lot of their other metal paints. They make a gold, which is very subtle, very sophisticated mm. looking they make a stainless steel which i used for my uh, contest entry at oticon recently mm -hmm. it looks like polished steel utensils if you go into wow. your drawer take out a spoon and turn it under a light it looks like all clad stainless steel paint okay wow that is amazing wow um yeah. was this your first time airbrushing doing gunpla Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've, wow. I've never touched an airbrush before. I was kind of intimidated because they always talk about how big, how much control is required, how yeah. much you got to worry about ratios and mixing. And, you know, I'll admit, I learned by making a metric ton of mistakes. So <laughs> I, I screwed up a lot. Mm. But I had a cheap airbrush and a cheap compressor. I knew that I wasn't going to get the world's greatest performance. Mm. You know, they're out there on Amazon for, I think, 40 or 50 bucks. Nice. You know, anybody with even a part-time job that doesn't have to worry too much about expenses can save up for it. Yeah. And, you know, once you have the right environment for it, you could do this in a garage. I, I ended up getting a spray booth to operate in my basement. Mm. But it's just a matter of practice, understanding your paint, understanding what you're doing. And the real key to airbrushing, from what I found, is put down a coat and wait. Set it aside. Mm. Give it 10 minutes, you know, or just five minutes if you're really just that impatient. Mm -hmm. Paint your part. Move on. Don't get it all in one go. You can't mm. do that with normal hand brushing either. But airbrushing, though, from all of the, the intimidation people talk up, <laughs> is a lot more forgiving than it has credit for. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, trial and error. I, I tell anybody who asks about it on any forum that I'm a part of, on Facebook or whatever, the first thing you're going to do is learn to disassemble your airbrush the same way that <laughs> Marines and soldiers <laughs> learn to disassemble their rifles. Yep. You know, you're you're going to need to be able to do this by touch in the dark, with mm -hmm. you know, upside down, if, that, if you have to. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense.
Yeah, I have the the same advice for folks getting into 3D printing because those nozzles just oh my gosh. You know, it's, it's the same kind of thing where, where where folks think, okay, I have this machine. The machine just does this thing. It's like no, you know, the, the machine is, is nice, but you're gonna have to learn how it actually works. Yeah, 3D printing is really cool. Actually, mm. there's a guy on something awful's Gunpla forum mm. who ended up pro modeling, prototyping, and now producing parts to convert the uh, Master Grade Tall Geese to a Leo. Which Whoa. is the single best grunt suit in the entire Gunpla universe. Hmm. Fight me if you think I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but he he's basically got a total conversion kit. Wow. Back in the day, you'd have to model in resin, cast yeah. yourself, and do the parts that way. Interesting. But he did it entirely through 3D printing. I got nothing but respect. You know, I, I, I am so intimidated by the design side of 3D printing. <laughs> but what this guy's done is it's going to be the future of Gunpla once mm. it hits Japan in a major economic scale. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the you know, the problem with three D printing, you know, fundamentally is um, size, because um, I've I played around with some of the, some of that stuff, and I mean, especially if you're going with some of the smaller kits, there's just almost no way to get a desktop three D printer to print a at the the resolution you need for that. Mm -hmm. um, is he working with with larger grade um, uh, gunplay? You know. He is. Uh, okay. The master grade line is one one hundred oh, yeah. scale. Yeah. So on average, they'll be maybe I want to say eight to ten inches tall. So you have a little bit of room for error. Yeah. And, and inevitably, you're going to be painting these. They're not coming sure. out in the kit colors. So you're going to be putting down primer anyway, or or you should be putting down primer. Once you have that down and sanded properly, any imperfections in the surface material are moot. Yeah. For all intents and purposes. That makes sense. And the sanding especially too. That would make, that make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, interesting. Cool. So, what are some of your favorite models to build? I guess, uh, you know, somehow along the line, I got into, I guess I'd have to say my favorite is any kind of DOM. Mm. I, for me, there's nothing that says this is a mechanical creation that is built solely for a practical purpose mm. and is humanoid only in a nod of a sense than a dom. <laughs> it, it looks like it's built as a giant big slab that is function over form in every way shape of the imagination mm -hmm. you know it's that special kind of ugly the same people that uh, <laughs> i mean look my favorite airplane is an a10 you know oh, yeah. decent point i like a monthly <laughs> but it also kind of emphasizes that these are purpose-built machines the yeah. dom was built in the whole gundam cannon to be a high-speed ground unit mm -hmm. which was adapted for a bunch of different roles mm -hmm. it has almost as many derivatives as the zaku wow. and that's that's saying a lot it is when you look at how individual mobile suits derive different functionality over time it i mean my baseline is i'm a cold war history buff i always uh, was growing up as a kid i was really interested in the soviet military and the idea of a third world war mm -hmm. and how different products how different aircraft armored vehicles ships how these had derivatives over time with each one having a functional improvement and a different purpose mm -hmm. you see the analogs so very clearly in gundam and in Gunpla, being able to build these in a user-friendly format, far more so than conventional scale models, it makes it makes it for a very interesting hobby. Absolutely. Do you think that's one of the reasons why we get so interested in Gundam? You know, that sort of verisimilitude, that that sense that these are, um, you know, analogous to, to tanks or jets in that universe. I think that's more just for me. I can't speak for other people. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to say that there is a connection between being into mechanical stuff mm -hmm. and being into Gunpla, because uh, my wife, look, you know, she's not a gearhead like me. Mm -hmm. She's a nerd. She's, you know, kind of like the JRPG gamer kind of person, okay. but she's very into what she's into. She isn't really into Gundam, but she will jump on any bear guy she sees. She, she thinks it's cute. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? more power to her. Yep. If you see something that you like, build it, go for it. You can have this as a model kit. And it doesn't have to be a amazing piece of work. And I still contend that anything I do is amateurish by comparison <laughs> to, and to what I've seen, to what my friends can do. Mm. But, you, but the good thing about Gunpla is that you don't need an amazingly huge skill set to pick it up and do it. Do you see a Gundam that you like? Is It, it doesn't matter mm. if it's high grade, master grade. If you like a freaking perfect grade, 
I got news for you. You can build a perfect grade very well if you just know how to use your tools properly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I recommend def- it. They're expensive. For, 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 <laughs> for those of us who, who yeah. don't know what perfect grade uh, is, that uh, what, what could you explain that? Sure. Um, roughly, Bandai classifies Gundams by different grades, um, starting from the smallest scale, high grade. That is uh, correspondent to one one forty fourth scale. So, if you have anything else of one one forty fourth scale, let's say you know a diorama that I'm working on, mm. I need a couple of tanks. If you have anything in one one forty fourth scale that is a tank, or anything in uh, what in, in end scale in railroading, mm. which roughly correlates, it is compatible and in scale with one one forty fourth high grades. Nice. They, you know, let's see. Next up is master grade. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in general, master grades have a lot more detail and a lot more parts than high grades. Mm. There are also one one hundred scale, you know, high grades. You know, air air coating mm. heavily. You know, some of the uh, I actually finished one recently, mm. but it's a one one hundred scale Gunner Zaku Warrior, the Luna Maria version. Mm. And these are just essentially scaled up high grades, but they are in one one hundred scale. Mm. You know, one hundred times bigger, and you have the real thing. Mm. Perfect grade is 1 60th in scale, has a drastically higher parts count, uh, usually has a lot more gimmicks and features, mm. and is considered the apex. Um, second only to perfect grade is the older HY2M line. That's what Bandai did before they had what's called P Bandai, premium Bandai. Mm. HY2M models, um, right now the big ones are the Goof and the Dom, as well as uh, the Sharsbrick Dom version, are 1 60th, but they have a lot of electrical parts to them. Mm. You you have circuitry, and it walks you through all this, so you don't really need to solder. Mm. But you've got a lot of details on the actual effect side. They're not necessarily perfect great in terms of mechanical detail. Uh. If you want something that shows the scale, the functionality, the inner systems of a basically a 150 foot tall walking bipedal <laughs> suit of powered mm. armor you get a perfect grade mm. if you want something that actually fits and can be afforded then you get the high the master grade or high grade. <laughs> you know and it's and i i don't want to put forth that there's any kind of snobbery here mm-hmm. you know you can do what you want there's no difference in difficulty per se mm. between the grades you just need to be able to follow the instructions in the manual which are essentially a series of pictures and drawings that are well thought out, hmm. well planned, and well executed. Bandai has smart people doing this. No kidding. I, I'm curious. Uh, did you start with uh, Gundam models, or had you uh, dabbled in uh, other model kits before getting into anime and hmm. Gundam? When I was a kid, I built you know a bunch of normal scale models. I did not build them well. <laughs> <laughs> I just assembled them poorly. Uh, never painted them, and just you know had them on my desk until my parents maybe recycled them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. J- just when I started going to anime cons, I got a couple of uh, Gunpla, and I didn't really do anything serious. I had, I think, uh, mm, my first one was, I think, the 1-100th, uh, you know, not Master Grade, but mm. one, the 1-100th one Blitz Gundam, which was, mm. at the time, my favorite from Gundam Seed. Mm. And I made the stupid, 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 stupid mistake <laughs> of getting the Wing Zero uh, version Ka. And oh. Um, to, to go into detail, version Ka is a kind of like a, I guess, a separate name that that mm. Bandai attaches to certain Master Grade kits, which means they've been uh, redesigned by Hajime Katoki, mm. who does a lot of mecha design. He did the designs for Wing and several others. And in general, they have a higher level of detail than other Master Grade counterparts of the same model. You know, the Wing Zero in this case, mm. you know, they did some changes, made some additional gimmicks. Mm-hmm. They also have approximately 37 billion stickers. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, yeah. My, the way that I describe version Ka to people is, you know, you have stickers. Warning, caution decal below. Caution, warning decal above. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they look awesome when done properly. Mm. But this was not something that I should have done as a new at mm. least with the level of knowledge that was available to me in 2005, I think I got it. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You know, I, I built these things with an X-Acto knife and wire cutters. Yep. 
and you know everybody's got to start somewhere that's where i started and i stopped shortly after that Ooh. you know i only picked it up again and i think 2013 that's when i really got into wow. the plot. C could you walk us through uh your technique evolution for going from uh uh, uh wire cutters and an x-acto knife to mm. to where you are where you are now what kind of uh additions you you stepped through and said oh i could do this and i could do that and okay <laughs> yeah yeah, the best way to describe it is kind of going into what I was taught when I got serious into this. So